Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. So good evening, welcome everyone. My name is Jante Mosselman. I'm a program editor here in the Bali. Um, and I'm moderating this evening for you that was made by my colleague Tim Wagemakers. So tonight um, we will discuss the new book, Inheritors of the Earth, by renowned ecologist Chris Thomas. And he is professor at the University of York where he researches how humans have transformed the biological world and how humans might protect um, the world's remaining biodiversity. He researches why and how species respond to climate change and why some species decline and disappear while others are successful. Um, he is interested in how climate change, land use change, the arrival of non-native species and persecution alter the distributions of species, aiming to quantify gains um, in diversity and as well as, their lo as, he, he, as he wants to uh, look at the losses of species. And while some species indeed disappear due to uh, uh, human-led changes to the biological world and, and due to climate change, um, he stresses in this new book that overall biodiversity has grown and humans might even have a positive effect on biodiversity. Um, he argues that the biological world is always changing um, and that environmentalists should take this into consideration um, and develop new conservation strategies that are not aimed at reducing or halting biological change. Um, Thomas, his views are quite uh, optimistic and therefore they are not, not controversial. Um, and um, well, uh, he, what's going to happen is he will uh, uh, give a, a, a lecture, and after that we will ask Hans de Kroon, a professor of plant ecology, to join him on stage. Uh, he will give a small lecture as well, and then we enter in a discussion. Um, and I'll first interview both of them for a while, uh, and after that I'll also ask you to join in. Um, you've probably been here before, and if you have not, there's always room for questions, and we really, really like that. Uh, but please make it a question and not a really long statement. Um, so is that all I want to say? No, there's one more thing that I should not forget to say. Uh, we are live streaming uh, this evening. So if you want to ask that really short question, um, I'm coming towards you with a microphone um, and you can speak into the microphone. So then um, I'm ready to announce Chris Thomas, give him a really big applause uh, and welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, both for the invitation to be here and thank you for uh, joining this um, discussion this evening. Um, the world is inevitably changing. The human population, seven point something billion now, by the middle of the century, it will be over nine billion, heading for maybe 10, perhaps a little bit more. The per individual rate of consumption of biological resources of food that we on the planet want is also going up. And if you ask me, this is a good thing because I would prefer people in Africa um, in particular, as the population is going to grow there the most, to have increased food availability in the future. The inevitability is, therefore, that there will be some biological losses on the planet as we move forward because the 
only other trade-off would be with the reduced condition of humans. We need our farmland, effectively, to be more productive. Some people have suggested we may need double the amount of food by tw the 2050s um, to feed the global demand. Well, the only way we're going to do that is to intensify our agriculture. There isn't really any alternative. And because the only other alternative, if we kept productivity the same, we'd need double the land area. And first of all, double the land area of productive farmland is not actually available. Uh, and secondly, that would have huge consequences for biological diversity. So that does mean that in parts of the world that are intensively farmed, there are going to be continuing declines of the certainly the abundances of many species. But this transformed world also generates lots of new uh, opportunities. Now, the biological system of the Earth, of course, um, as we've known ever since Darwin, has been about evolution, speciation, and the generation of biological diversity. And, in fact, most of the biological diversity in the planet is, in fact, in lots of different microbes of various types, bacteria and these things called archaea. And there's a huge amount of biological diversity. And then just on the tips of, the, um, of this branch of the tree of life, we see animals. The um, ones we're most familiar with are often the things like the mammals and the birds, which are big things that we can spot and count and identify, and things like plants. Now, during the history of life on Earth, the the gains slightly have it. Most species that have ever lived on the planet have gone extinct. But the rate of diversification averaged across the last three, four billion years has the average rate of diversification has been slightly higher than the rate of extinction, such that we now have this incredible biological diversity on the Earth. And so given that the biological systems are dynamic, both in an evolutionary sense like this, and also ecologically, because species, uh, individuals of a particular population of a given species are born, they die, and individuals move during their lifetime. And these processes of ecology are dynamic ones, and species interact with other species. These are all dynamic, and therefore life is a dynamic process in ecology on the short term and evolution on the longer term. These dynamic processes did not stop when humans hit the planet. They actually went into overdrive. Because one thing we really do know with quite a great deal of certainty is when the environment changes rapidly, biological ex uh, responses tend to accelerate rather than decelerate. So whilst there are many losses, there are also many biological gains. At the moment, we're focused on the potential for a huge loss. Um, in this nice book by, a really nice book by Betsy Colbert called The Sixth Extinction, she uh, lays out what a lot of scientists have been talking about for quite a while, as are we heading towards the sixth mass extinction that has taken place in the last half billion years? The jury is out. We have some time to react to this. Um, at the current rate of extinction, people argue, depending on um, exactly how you do your calculation, but it might be anything from a few thousand years to 10,000 or so years at the current rate of extinction before we would reach the three quarters of species having gone extinct. We don't want to get to that point because all of the the biological communities, the living system that we are integral part of relies on those biological systems. So this is something that we want to avoid. But we are progressing at a rate that over about um, 60,000 uh, years, which might seem like a very long time to most of us, uh, but 60,000 years is absolutely nothing in the history of life. Over a period of about 60,000 years, we as humans, a completely different type of animal that's done weird stuff like build this nice building um, and amazingly live stream me to wherever, um, that, that um, this is an incredible a surprise for the planet. But it has evolved out of the natural biological system. We're a completely natural part of biology. It's just that we've done weird stuff you couldn't have anticipated if you went back a few hundred thousand years. So this could happen, but we want to head it off. I am not denying any of the 
uh, arguments about how much biological diversity or how many species are in decline. The, this has been brought home to us in the last week or so with the death of Sudan, the last male north white rhinoceros. Um, his sperm has uh, been um, uh, has been frozen, uh, and it was only a subspecies, but that's still somewhat genetically distinct. So this is a really sad event that um, a type of huge animal has been lost for no purpose whatsoever that can't be achieved by chewing your nails, since the horn uh, is more or less the same as the keratin in your fingernails. Um, so this is a pretty pointless extinction, um, and the sort of thing that really we as humans could do well to avoid. But because bad stuff is happening, because we are taking, again, estimates vary, perhaps a quarter, perhaps a third of the primary production, as to say the growth of the vegetation and plants across the surface of the land, somehow are being used either directly by us for our crops or being fed to our livestock that we then eat. It is inevitable that uh, lots of other species are declining. But in all of this new transformed world that we generate, species don't, nature doesn't just say, OK, get on with it, I'm not coming in here. Nature actually um, continues. So when the environment changes, the climate changes, the types of habitat change, species are moved to a new part of, a, of the world, they, they uh, experience new conditions, and as a result of that, their evolutionary rate accelerates. As the environment changes, species move from one location to another, sometimes on their own, because they take advantage of new habitats, for example, that we have created, and other times because we move them directly. And because of all of this combination of species moving, their abundance is changing, uh, and uh, evolution as well as ecological changes, then the biological communities, what sets of species we've got in any one location, is in a rather rapid rate of change at the moment. The fact that the rate of change is high is not in itself particularly alarming, because a rate of high a high rate of change actually means that the biological system is responding to the perturbation that we have put on the planet. And that, that can be actually a way that it effectively mends itself, you could think of. So often we seem to take our attitude to nature is often that it was this sort of lovely thing that at some time in the past, at a rather undefinable time, it might be the Middle Ages, it might be before humans left Africa, whatever it is, that sort of nature was somehow a perfect finished object that we have then perturbed. But um, it wasn't. Nature is a process. Everything in nature is a process. And we are now an integral part of that process in every part of the planet. There isn't a natural bit and a human altered bit. It is all human altered, but to different extents. And so uh, we shouldn't behave as though nature's a sort of masterpiece like this fresco in a church in Spain, I think it was, that um, uh, a lovely, kind-hearted lady thought that it's a bit damaged, so she cleaned it up a bit and then filled in the gaps. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but we do, of course, your museums, of course, here are full of very nicely restored paintings from the last few centuries that are done slightly more uh, effectively than this. Um, but we shouldn't think that nature's like this. It isn't. It's a set of processes. And so it, we can't say, well, the nature was right in the 1950s or it was 19, ni right in 1800. Because if you do that, you effectively are saying, well, all the changes that took place up to that date, whatever your baseline is, that that was all good, all the ecological and evolutionary change. And any change since that date is then, by definition, a bad thing because you're moving away from that state. But if you move, if you move that baseline date um, to a different time, you then simply um, change the fraction, alter the fraction of those biological changes that you deem to be either good or bad. So just to illustrate the extent to which um, 
biological systems change, I dug a hole in my field. I'm fortunate to have a couple of hectares of pasture um, and wanted to think about uh, what biological changes have taken place in what I'm going to say is the extremely recent history of our planet. When I was a child, I told my mother I was going to dig a hole and, and reach Australia, but um, that proved not to be practical, but it was much easier to dig a hole and visit the Ice Age. And so this is the sort of system that you see. So I've dug my little hole here, and there I'm looking rather pleased. I was actually grimace, um, that's not a smile, it's a grimace from the exhaustion of um, digging all that soil out. Um, and at the bottom here, we've got clay, and that was the base of a lake, and one of the fish um, that was in that was this Arctic char, um, and there were lots of diatoms and so on that were associated now with Arctic types of environment. There might well have been polar bears, in fact, in, the, um, in that system, um, and this is some hapless um, um, fisherman who, that I put the a reconstructed head of an, uh, a more primitive human uh, on there body, uh, with apologies to whoever they are. So then the, um, the, the lake, which was fed by the melting glaciers, um, it actually burst as uh, it, was, it was dammed in by ice. And when that ice broke through, there was a great big whoosh. Uh, well, I presume it was. I wasn't actually there. Um, and a great big whoosh, and it would all went out into the North Sea and would have sent a tsunami in the direction of uh, your lovely country. Um, and so... It was then replaced by um, steppe, sort of grassland, sand dunes, and a certain amount of marshland. So this was a landscape that had um, uh, large numbers of mammoths roaming over it, woolly rhinoceros, and we know this kind of thing because Indeed, your fishermen keep dredging them from the bottom of the North Sea when they go, um, they go trawling. They end up getting their nets caught in, in mammoth bones. So there was this vegetation, um, a sort of open grasslandy type vegetation with extremely large um, animals in it. Then the climate warms starting about 11,500 years ago and from about 10,000 years onwards, we've got a forest that develops. Then it turns into, um, as uh, my ancestors or rather some rather, f maybe also some rather fierce people from Europe arrived and um, came up the river close to us um, in the Viking era and um, started to cultivate the land, and now it's a horse pasture. Now, the point that I want to make is that the set of species in the lake are obviously complete, almost completely different from the ones that were in this grassland landscape. The set of species that were in the forest are pretty much completely different from the ones that were in the grassland before. The set of species in this, what became a flower-rich, and now people sort of have conservation crops where they have lots of wild flowers in them and they have conservation headlands where they don't spray herbicide in the field margin, so we can have these um, sort of ancient weeds growing in the crop. Um, and that then there's almost complete change in species as well, going from the crop to a pasture, and uh, half of it is grazed like this, and the other part is, a, you can just see in the background, a quite tall hayfield. Now, there's nothing special about this spot of land, but there has been a complete change in the biological communities from here to here, one, two, three, four. So the set of species in any one location on, I know that seems like quite a long time to most of us and when we're thinking about conservation decisions, but this is an extremely recent period. The set of species in any one location changes. So the idea that we should try and keep everything the same isn't, um, is, doesn't reflect history. And we know that whenever the environment changes rapidly, as it is today, the transition of species and biological communities takes place. Whoops. <coughs> now, we add, as these new environments come into existence, species have to get there. And one of the most rapid processes by which this is being achieved in the modern day is by people either deliberately or accidentally moving species from 
one location to another. So this graph is one of Dan Symboloff's, um, and this is the number of non-native, let's say, introduced by people, uh, mammal species that have established. This line here is the number of mammals that have established in Europe that weren't here previously. And this is the number that established in New Zealand until they enacted um, legislation to stop further imports and then even exterminated a few of them. The message here is actually the number of species is going up. We've, we've in the same period, we've essentially not lost any uh, European or uh, mammals, and New Zealand has lost a number of birds, but the total number of terrestrial vertebrates is now higher than it was. So, the new species that are arriving, and to a large extent living in these human-derived environments, are actually potentially, have the potential to increase the total number of species in any region. So now we've got a little quiz question. Um, so, so the first is just a premise. Um, so uh, the official line is, well, it's about 1,865, but Helen Roy, who is responsible for a lot of this work, thinks it's probably closer to 2,000. Without counting microbes, we've got about 2,000 introduced species that have been established in Britain and are living in the wild. So my question for you is, how many native species have become extinct from the whole of Britain as a direct consequence of the new arrivals? Anyone want to offer a guess? Any advance on nil? One. <coughs> Five we've got. Th a thousand. Yeah, well, that would be good. It could be 2,000, one in, one out. That would be ecological balance. What's wrong with that? You, you know. <laughs> the answer is zero. And so, but very often these non-native species are being blamed for ousting a native species. And sometimes, and some of the native species have indeed declined as a consequence of the arrival, not of most of the non-native species, but one or two of them have had major consequences. The red squirrel in Britain is much rarer because the grey squirrel has established populations over much of the country. So then we come to um, evolution. And when the environment changes and new biological communities come into existence, as they already have, species start to evolve and they adjust to one another. Evolution is a continuous process. It isn't something that just happens over very long periods of time. And this is a nice example of Taylor's checker spot, which is it's actually a subspecies, a bit like uh, just as the northern white rhinoceros was. But Taylor's checker spot is now pretty much completely dependent on this plant, Plantago lancia later, which is a common plant in the Netherlands, though it wasn't before uh, humans arrived here and transformed the landscape. So we've got a North, native North American type of butterfly that's related to the marsh fritillary. I don't know if anyone can translate that into um, the Dutch for the marsh fritillary butterfly. Um, but this butterfly, anyway, now survives by feeding on a foreign plant. Now, so it didn't die out because we have changed the biological communities. In fact, it turns out that its original habitat was a type of habitat that was maintained because the native North American human population had periodically burnt vegetation. It lived in these post-burn types of open habitat. And so it had already evolved, if most likely, to be associated with human habitats, and now it's evolved again. So evolution doesn't stop. And that means that because everything's been evolving in response to all of the environmental changes that we've been making, all the biological changes that are going on, it means that we can't just unpick the whole thing and imagine it's going to go back to what it once was. Evolution is going further than this, though, because we're starting to see the formation of new species. And this is a nice example, the Italian sparrow. Um, here, um, a photograph I took um, in, um, on, in southern uh, Switzerland on the border with Italy. And this guy is, we now know, 
formed as a hybrid between the house sparrow, which was originally not a hugely widespread species in the steppes of uh, Western and Central Asia. When people started to develop agriculture, the house sparrow and a sort of quite familiar story it came on board, it was much easier for it to find piles of grain in uh, villages than it was to search out s grass seeds on the steppe. So it moved in and it liked sort of cracks in um, banks and so on to nest in. And uh, it turned out that our houses were quite convenient cracks to nest in instead. So it moved around the world with us and in some cases we moved it deliberately. But as it moved into Europe, it met these guys that we, at least the British call the Spanish sparrow, but it was just the Mediterranean sparrow effectively. They met up, hybridized in the Italian peninsula, and now we have what seems to be a self-sustaining species, a new one that has hybridized, and it, doesn't, it does still breed slightly uh, with the house sparrow in the foothills of the Alps, but it's effectively as good as any other species of bird. It's a very recent hybrid origin, and it wouldn't exist but for the land use changes, the conversion of the land to uh, farmland um, that weed that our ancestors achieved. And so this, incidentally, the Italian sparrow, is one of the very, very few species of bird that is entirely restricted to Europe. So in, it, because it happened a few thousand years ago, most likely, it's close to top of the sort of priority list for maintaining a species. But if it had just happened a f 10 years ago, we would be shooting them. We would be. We shot, we've been shooting hybrid ruddy ducks, that the two types of ducks, the North American duck and the European white-headed duck, they have met, they've hybridized. We've been shooting the American parent and we've been shooting the hybrid. And in New Zealand, they're killing off hybrids between two types of stilt bird that have been forming recently. But this would have been exactly the same sort of process, but it's been going on for long enough that it's now a high conservation priority rather than an evolutionary and ecological disaster. So, quiz question number two, and keep your mouth shut. I don't want the correct <laughs> answer immediately. Um, <laughs> so, so, this is a sad loss. So, uh, one species that's been native to Britain um, has become extinct since uh, the year 1700, and that is the great orc. Um, and uh, again, that's a needless extinction because we hunted it for feathers and meat um, in a, an unsustainable way, um, um, and it could have survived. There was nothing wrong with it as a species. So how many new species have come into existence in Britain since 1700? Any guesses? 1500. 1500. Wow. Well, that would be fantastic. We'd be a world center of endemism. <laughs> um, any, any, anyone slightly more, um, shall I say, realistic? <laughs> Zero? <laughs> hmm? Anything, anything. Anything that we know about. I, most of the things that might have come into existence, um, we, won't, we may well not know about. But No, it's not that many. But the answer is um, that we know of uh, seven. They're all plants. Um, but plants are a really important thing because the plants are the key determinants of insect and fungal and a lot of microbial diversity. And so um, the whole of all food webs are based uh, and depend to a great extent on the diversity of the plant communities. And so the coming into existence of new plants is particularly important. So we've got some senecios that have come into existence, some mimulus monkey flowers. So the parents of these plants, uh, one of them came from South America, one came from North America. They were isolated, but they found true love in the highlands of Scotland and uh, mated and they produced sterile offspring. But the sterile offspring were actually quite, grew quite rapidly along uh, moist ditches and so on. So this sterile hybrid offspring survived. And then uh, on a couple of different occasions, the 
basically the, the chromosome number of the plants has doubled such that they became uh, sexually viable plants and now they are sexually reproducing plants endemic to Britain. Um, so that's a really tricky one because now we've got a set of species. So all of these involve at least one and often two of the parents being brought to Britain by Victorian naturalists or whoever it might be. And now they are restricted to our country. Should we now be protecting these as much or are they invasive aliens that we should try and exterminate? Well, it's, in the end, it's a social choice what we want to do and whether we, got, we really care about these things. But they meet, you could argue in, in the details, but they pretty much meet the definition of species as uh, a scientific construct, as well as a high proportion of all the other species on the planet meet any definition of a species. So if I now just sort of recap a bit, how's diversity changing? And I'm just using Britain as an example. I use my garden example because it's any old bit of trashed out bit of the planet that humans have modified very heavily. And there's now, because of all of these new arrivals, there are more species in Britain than there were 300 years ago. There's more species in Britain today than there were 30 years ago. There's more species in Britain today than there were 10 years ago. The rate of arrival is higher than the rate of loss. In the world, well, this is, if we were just to say what's Britain's contribution to the number of species on the planet, in fact, more species have come into existence in Britain in the last 300 years than have died out from the planet. Of course, my relatives um, completely messed up large other parts of the planet and are responsible for lots of other extinctions elsewhere. Um, but um, just if you think of Britain, it seems quite clear that more species come into existence in this bit of chunk, chunk of land in these last few hundred years than have died out. So that doesn't mean that we don't co aren't concerned about the losses or that we should treasure the new things that more than the old. But it does mean that the gain of new species and new adaptations like that checker spot and all of these new arrivals, they are a sufficiently large number that when we're doing our biological accounts, of debits, losses. If you do your financial accounts, you don't just list your expenditure, you also list your income. And I believe that with the biological world, we're in danger with all of our indicators of species decline and so on. We very often, not exclusively, but we have a tendency to bias it towards the loss component and not to count the gain part of the biological equation. Indeed, we tend to consider the gain part, like all of those non-native species, as yet further evidence that the planet's gone wrong. But because we know species have moved through time, as we saw in my garden, then it doesn't make sense to only count the things that have been there for the last few hundred years as a, as a part of that biological diversity. So if we now think about other parts of the world, we also know that most countries and most islands in the world have increased the number of species. If you look at Pacific Islands, for example, most of them on average have about twice as many plant species as they did have, although some species have gone extinct. And I would argue very strongly that we should try and minimize the rate at which species go extinct. So we might be inching towards the six maths extinction. The last five mass extinctions appear to have been under a rather unknown, after a rather unknown time delay because the geological record is a bit coarse. But the past mass extinctions have led to a subsequent diversification in life. The rate of extinction on the Earth at the moment is higher than the long-term average. There's no doubt about that. The rate of decline of many species is higher than you might sort of expect under a normal unperturbed system. There's no question about that. So we are seeing quite a lot of declines. We're seeing some extinctions. We could be heading for a sixth mass extinction. But bizarrely, we may already be 
heading for a six mass origination. In fact, we might have this six mass origination even if we skip the mass extinction this time round. And the rationale for that is partly all these new hybrids that are coming into existence at probably the fastest race of speciation uh, conceivably ever, because there's never been a time that species mix like that before. But what we're also seeing is all the species, so take um, raccoon dogs um, f that come from Eastern Asia, now they're established in Europe. There's a population at both ends of the Eurasian continent now. Eventually, they will start diverging into new forms of species. This kind of plant, a centaurea, a star thistle, this that was studied in California, is already roughly 50% um, uh, incompatible with the its uh, original populations that came from Spain and Portugal. So in a quite short period of time, there's a degree of sterility has established between the populations of this one plant from California and uh, Spain. So at what point are they going to have diverged enough that we decide that they're separate species? Is it going to be after a few more centuries, a few more thousand years, or even 10,000 years, or, or 100,000? But at some point, they're going to be different. And we have turned the whole world into one enormous global archipelago. So in the Galapagos Islands, we've got so many species get generated because this one population moves to a new island, diverges into a new form there, and eventually you've got two species, and then one of those two species starts to spread around the other islands again. And we're doing this at a continental scale. We're transporting vast numbers, thousands, tens of thousands of species to new continents where eventually they're going to diverge. If we all disappeared right now today, this would be the indelible signature of humanity on the Earth because all of these types of animals and plants that originated in one continent and now in lots of additional continents, where they will diversify, you'll get different forms in different habitats and different species in different continents. So we're living in this incredibly dynamic world of change that increasingly people, uh, certainly scientists, are increasingly calling the Anthropocene. And it is different from the world that went before. And other than remove us all, and some trials try to repatriate all the species to where they came from, we can't go backwards. We've just got to get used to the idea that we're living in a very rapidly changing world and get used to it. And instead of just saying, it's all going horribly wrong, every time we say something's going horribly wrong, we can say, yes, how could we fix this? But simultaneously, in this world of change, it are the positive options to foster increased biological diversity that we could also adopt. So I'd say fight loss, yes, but don't fight change. That change is inevitable, and indeed change is in some senses a sign that nature is coping, and promote biological gains rather than try and stop everything from um, responding to our actions. So we have gazillions of um, questions that we can ask, like philosophical ones, really. And I think that's a lot of what this is about, uh, about us accepting change. And given that change is happening, what are we going to, what are our attitudes and what are we going to do about it? So are the new species worse than the old ones? Well, actually, every new species has exactly the same length of evolutionary history as every previous species, every other species does. Because life originated at a particular time, we're all just the species, the tips of the evolutionary tree of life that happens to exist at a particular time. So I find it difficult to argue that the new species are worse unless they are inconvenient to us. But many of the old species are inconvenient to us. I mean, the wolves are coming back, and those are going to be mightily inconvenient to the Dutch population by the time there's a few thousand wolves wandering across the countryside. <laughs> what are our attitudes going to be to changing biological communities? What do we make our prescriptions in conservation? What, uh, do we just accept it and go with it? Do we try and direct it in certain ways that we might like? And critically, in the context of climate change, where the prediction is 
that maybe of the order of 10, even 20% of species could be left stranded and endangered because they can't move to the parts of the planet where the climate is increasingly becoming suitable for them, should we actually start to move species around to the places where they are able to survive and thrive in the future, rather than our general strategy at the moment, which is only to consider keeping them and saving them within their current homeland. So I'll leave it there, and thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you very yeah. much for that. Um, <laughs> before uh, uh, we'll continue, I want to ask you two questions. And the first of that is, um, some species are becoming extinct. You just explained that to yep. us. But are there also some species that should really not become uh, extinct at this moment that we really should try to preserve? Well, it's really hard to take a bet on what the winners will be. So we can point to species that are important to us today. But I, given that we d none of us has got the faintest idea what humans are going to do to the planet over the next, even a shorter time as 200, 300 years. And so of all the species that exist at the moment, some of them by chance are going to turn out to be quite well suited to whatever it is we next do to the planet. And that's why I would go for a saving as many species as possible. So let me give you one example, Please. because often people say that very rare localized species are kind of unimportant. We shouldn't care about these rare species. And I give you the Monterey pine, which only occurs in small populations along the co coast of California and also in a couple of islands that are offshore of uh, Mexico. It's a very rare species. It's declining because of climate change. It's also under threat from pathogenic disease. But some crazy foresters, or they just got lucky, I think, they took some seed to New Zealand and uh, they started to grow it there and found it grew quite well. Then they developed new varieties that grew even faster. And now it's Pinus radiata, and radiata is the single most important commercial forestry tree in New Zealand, Australia, and several South, Af uh, South American countries, and it's gone wild in South Africa. So this is a species that's really rare and is now commercially incredibly important, and it's actually saved from extinction. Um, but via populations that are living in the southern hemisphere. So I don't think we're going to be able to anticipate what the next Pinus radiata is going to be. And that's why I think we have to save as much as we can, but we're not going to manage it completely. No. All right, thank you very much. Thank we'll thank we'll get to a few questions uh, uh, you just also put on the screen. But before that, I want to go to Hans de Kroon. Um, he is a professor of plant ecology at the Radboud Universiteit Nijmegen. Um, his career, scientific career is devoted to plant traits and how they are regulated and have evolved and how they contribute to the success of populations and communities. Um, and he develops processes that maintain the biodiversity in ecosystems. Um, and the Kroon, he acquired worldwide recognition with his famous study that showed how over the past 27 years, more than three-fourths of the insects disappeared from German nature. Uh, and this led to a media storm, but we might touch upon that later on. Um, and it provoked many initiatives to uh, uh, protect our biodiversity. Big applause, please. <laughs> Um, it was in the late 1980s that a group of very dedicated entomologists in Germany made a plan. They made a plan to map insect diversity in Germany in a very specific way. Not just to collect insects, no, to harvest them in a very systematic way so that they had an idea on what insects would be there, but also on the quantity of insects. And here you see what they set up as what is called a malaise trap. Um, and this is how it looks. Uh, the way it works is that uh, insects are dwelling around, they get into this tent like structure, they don't like the dark, they go up where it's light, and eventually they are catched here in a bottle of alcohol. 
They've been setting this up very systematically, sampling as many different habitats as they possibly could, S sampling particularly habitats where they um, thought was, let's see whether the next slide is coming up. So many different habitats where they thought they would harvest as many different insects. So here we, we, we can see these kinds of nature reserves, quite wet, I all interspersed in, in the agricultural landscapes. Here a more dry area, some were small, some were large, and they went on going, doing their way. Uh, and they were collecting many, many different insects. This is what you get if you, if you, if you empty the bottle in a plate. This is what you see, many, many different insects, and they had lots of work to, to actually sort them out. And the very special thing what they did is not that just, you know, just look at the insect and pick up some um, groups they were interested in, um, but especially, and I think uh, there's a problem with this one. Um, the other thing they did was actually to weigh all the samples. And here is uh, Hein Schwan, one of the uh, members of the Ecological Society in uh, Krefeld. He's actually an analytical chemist by profession. And from the very beginning, he's been measuring, as he only can do in a very, very precise way, the biomass that was sampled. So that's what they did. But then, after 10 years or so, they figured out that these bottles were emptier and emptier. In the beginning, they really had to empty those bottles, say every 10 days, every two weeks, because they were simply completely full with, it, with, with insects. But after a little while, they found that over the same time span, these, these bottles were half full or even less. They could keep them on for three or four weeks and only then it was filled with insects. And here we see Martin Sor, who is very much the architect of this whole plan, the, uh, explaining to journalists what the differences were that they were finding. As they were moving along, their study object was slipping through their fingers. And it is with that information and lots and lots of data that we got in touch a few years ago. And um, we got in touch, uh, uh, and they were very concerned. They said, you know, could you really properly analyze these data? Could you see what, was, what is going on, uh, investigate the climate, see what land use changes are taking place? And this is exactly what we did. And, um, and this is a subset of the data um, uh, from our analysis. I actually, I, I didn't analyze the data myself. <coughs> I, I had the privilege to supervise this, uh, this analysis. Um, after a little while, you can see that here, they started to repeat the same locations and indeed to find that they found much less insects over there than in previous years. Um, and here you can see what, what, uh, um, what came out. Uh, and if you, if you add this up and you do the right corrections for climate change and land use change, we find a decrease of three quarters of the biomass. Well, um, we brought that out and it actually shocked a lot of people. It shocked a lot of people. It raised a lot of concern about what might be going on here. How can it be? that of the whole insect group, three quarters disappears. And, and look, this is not a species replacement. This is not a group of species that, not, that cannot, uh, say, keep up with the pace of the current era. No, um, it's a whole group that is disappearing. It's not that other species are moving in, taking the place of the species that disappear. It's the whole group that is going down. And that is a pretty shocking event. Kate Raworth, uh, author of the famous book, Donut Economics, referred to our study as the canary in the coal mine. She says in this interview that biodiversity is really collapsing. And this is an example of, of what is behind this. That's the canary in the coal mine. But what is the, can what is the coal mine? What is the coal mine we're talking about? Is the coal mine described in Chris Thomas' book? 
in part, but not quite, I think. What Chris is presenting, as he just presented here, um, is how humans are, have been changing nature through time. It's a very old process from the very moment that humans got in the world, entered new areas. Um, they've been changing nature all the time. But he's particularly has been describing how now, gradually, nature is bouncing back. Bouncing back because of the very characteristics of nature that we tend to forget. Nature is very dynamic. There's, there's a huge ecological dynamic. There's a huge possibility for response. And there's evolution, evolution that is taking place in a far more uh, speedy way than we have anticipated, for example, 50 years ago. And yet, I don't think it's the coal mine that he describes. What I found striking in the final chapter of the book that he describes as something that, we, that I, would, I would call um, a new Arcadia. Very different from the Arcadia, the landscape where humans lived um, um, in equilibrium with nature, a landscape that has never existed. But it is a new Arcadia. It's a new Arcadia where he describes these processes as taking place leading eventually to more biodiversity on Earth um, than we have in, in, in the past times, and with a human thriving population. Well, that's not the coal mine, right? So what is the coal mine? Maybe this is the coal mine then. This is a report that came out last week a uh, big group of people, big group of scientists, more than 500 scientists contributed to this report uh, under the UN flag, describing the um, decrease of global biodiversity on all the different continents, and with a strong warning. They are describing that numbers of species have been plummeting with uh, dozens of percentages in all of these continents. And they say human well-being is really at risk here because essential functions of this biodiversity are at stake. Um, uh, so we really have to do something about this. And they report some successes as well, where protection measures on the, these different continents have had some success. So maybe this is the coal mine, and I think it raises a number of questions. It raises questions when is biodiversity declining when it has a story to tell for us, that we're really degrading our environment to a way that is actually, in the end, dangerous for us? Um, that may not be the topic of the book. It is definitely the something that we have to deal with. There are multiple causes for biodiversity decline, and perhaps we um, should take this very seriously. Most importantly, how can we reconcile the vision that we have from the book and the vision that we have from studies like this? I think that is a major thing we have to talk about. And then, what is it that we have to do? We shouldn't, find will we shouldn't fight windmills, is basically what, what Chris is saying to us. And of course, we can only be right, but then what is it that we have to do? In Holland, uh, this is an action from uh, Natuur Monument, one of the biggest nature conservation organizations in the country, Save Our Insects. Um, many of these sorts of initiatives are now coming up in Germany, other countries as well. Are they useful? Is this the windmill we are finding at? Or is this what we ac actually should be doing? Um, in Holland, there's now um, a, a big group of people working on a national plan for the protection of biodiversity, um, which is great, but how should we do this? Can we make use, I think this is a grand question, can we make use of exactly the processes described in the book, the ecological and evolutionary processes leading to resilience of the system? to use that in a sensible way that we can protect our insects and we can protect biodiversity in Western Europe. I think we have something to talk about.
Thank you. Do you want to speak okay. a minute or then I'll sort of around? <laughs> All right, thank you both very much and also thank you for, for, for being here and already lecturing us on some things. Um, I'm going to start positively. So, uh, Professor de Croon, could you tell us um, um, some points you read in the book of Professor Thomas uh, when you thought, where you thought about, like, oh, I really agree with that? What I absolutely agree with is um, that one of the ma major tenets in the book is that nature is extremely dynamic. There's no such thing as a single reference point no matter you know whether this is in recent time or or, or, or or further in history, nature is always changing. I mean, this is exactly what I also try to teach my students at Radboud University. Is you know, if if they talk about ecological equilibrium, it seems at high school everybody's talking about ecological equilibrium. I don't know why that is true. Um, uh, and what we're trying to to do is all the time say there is no such thing as equilibrium. Everything is really changing. So that's a reality, and it's also a power. And I think that is a really, prof really uh, positive thing about the book, that we are now confronted with that power. And if you had to name one critique point, point of critique? I think we need to talk about scale and pace. Why? Because um, I think we need to talk about scale, because it is certainly true that what is happening at the scale of a nature reserve, what is happening at the scale of a region, is very different uh, from what is happening on a continent or, or even at the global scale. Um, if the rate of evolution of species formation would be bigger than the rate of species loss, I think that would be really interesting to know at a global scale. At a local scale, we've, s we've seen that that is not happening. And that's also why small islands, you know, are, you know, sort of, are, are, are completely, uh, the, the, the old, the old uh, uh, um, species are, are simply eradicated. And that's also what you saw happening in Germany on a local scale. Well, uh, you know, uh, yes, yes, of course. That is, that is what's happening there, but it was also a quite a vast area uh, where our, our colleagues investigated, so that, that's important. Pace is another thing. The big difference, what's happening now compared to what has happened in the past is the speed with which everything is taking place. Mm -hmm. And I have really my serious doubts whether the current evolutionary processes, although they work in a far better, far more speedy way than we anticipated in the past, can keep up with the current uh, um, uh, pressure we put on our natural environment. Okay, um, so skill and pace. Okay, so if we take the spatial scale. So, so first thing I should say, I th thoroughly enjoyed your talk. It was great. And um, likewise, the 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 so the biomass issue is being driven by major changes of abundance in what is currently an unknown number of the larger species must have been declining to generate this big change in biomass. So when I'm talking about diversity, though, I'm talking about the variety of species in any one location, not their total abundance. Mm -hmm. With the human population growing and the need for more food, more of the plant life on the planet will go to us. That does mean that the total biomass of all non-human stuff and that isn't associated with our agriculture is going to continue to go down. That is an inevitability and that is actually a desirability that it happened that we intensify our farming because if we don't intensify our farming further um, we won't we would have to double the farming area which we can't do so um, but if we look at the number of species in samples the biggest compilations that have been published in the world so far, which have been published in the last few years, one by a person uh, led by a person called Mark Felland in Canada, mm. another by Maria Dornelis at St Andrews in Scotland, 
is showing that there is no detectable decline across multiple samples, not mm. geographically spread all over the world, but mm. over many parts of the world, in the number of species per sample on time scales of several decades. So the local scale, we do not have the clear evidence of inexorable decline in local diversity. Some things are declining, absolutely, but also some things are coming in. But because often those come from foreign parts, then they are also frowned upon. Then if we go to the scale of countries um, and regions like oceanic islands, for example, we know that the, the evidence is quite clear for the, for the um, plants, particularly and animal groups that have been analyzed, that on average, those areas now tend to contain more species. So for plants, which as I said, are key to the mm -hmm. basis of um, whole biological communities, uh, oceanic islands now on average have about twice as many plant species mm -hmm. as they used to, despite the important and regrettable global extinction of some plants mm -hmm. that only used to live in those. And for European countries and American states, on average, they have about 20% more plant species than they used to a few centuries ago. At a global level, certainly for animals, the rate of extinction of species is higher than the rate of formation of new species. For plants, it is probably also the case, but at the moment, mm -hmm. the, d the virtually zero data that exist are actually that more species of new mm -hmm. plants have come into existence in Europe than have died out in the last 300 years, and the same is true for the continental North America. And so that's the s number of species evidence that I am aware of. Uh, before we move to pass, do you want to react on that? Um, I we probably agree that it would be really interesting how this is really taking place um, and where we are at the moment. Now, because we have just said nature is dynamic very much, this is not the end point where we are. Oh, of I mean, course not. No, um, <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, it's going to this change for as long as we can moving think on. And one thing that is moving on uh, is that although many species have not gone extinct, many species have gone very rare. And, and for those, you know, uh, studies, uh, uh, species groups that are studied, you know, also very well that although, and that's probably also true in Britain for plants and for birds, that some species have gone in decline and reduced to very small numbers, but have not gone extinct. So how is, it gonna, uh, how is this going to be, let's say, in 20, 30 years' time? I mean, maybe then uh, the, the, the whole balance will, will, so will flip yeah. over again. So this comes back to the pace thing. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> and I think that's a, a key thing. So, there's, so and the answer is we need more do information. We, we, we're both scientists, and, and a lot of the things where we are yes. taking different views are where, honestly, we would probably both agree that it would be better have more information and then we will be more sure about exactly what is happening. But in terms of the rate, people often say that there's this enormous extinction debt out there that in other words species have got rare eventually they're going to die out whether it be from mm. a region or mm -hmm. from the world and so if we take the number of species in a country like this one so are there are yes lots of very rare species actually most of those rare species are associated with the kinds of habit habitats that your ancestors created when they made mm -hmm. meadows mm -hmm. out of forests and when they did medieval agriculture of cutting the forest in a certain way and those are no longer economic ways of managing the land and that set of species is disappearing again but that said so we've got a set of species that are rare and declining that might die out but we have also got a set of other species in the rest of the world that might be going to come in. And we don't, it's just as realistic that there's effectively a colonization lag. As we change the mm. world, there's a whole set of other species that, that can now change in the new, live in the new environments we've created, but they haven't got here yet. And do, so do you have an example just to okay. mm. of something that Many. is going and something that Many. is coming in? Maybe they might come the in. The cattle egret. Just one, you have many more. But 
Yeah, you I haven't mean, talked about the Cattle League Red yet. No, I haven't. I haven't indeed. Um, so, um, so well, if you go to um, South America, for example, um, and uh, so I visited the Atlantic region of Brazil because I was particularly interested in because it's held up as the classic case of. Um, uh, destruction of habitat, endangerment of species, extinction, debt, the fact that more species are going to die out in the future. And to my surprise, I found that in the grasslands that had been created in the land that had been forest, there were actually more new species like cattle egret, like cattle tyrant, that's a kind of flycatcher, like burrowing owl, which um, like is an owl that's got very long legs and likes to run around in grass and in grassland catching its prey. So funnily enough, more species of new bird had arrived into this transform landscape than have actually died Ooh. out as species from the whole of this region. Now, I am not advocating we transform the rest of it. I would, I would advocate that we restore some of the uh, forest because the remaining 7% is probably too little to maintain all of those species in the long run. But as time goes on, there's a lag of species. Chalk grassland in southern England is the most species-rich habitat that we have got, at least botanically and for insects. And this grassland was created by our ancestors when they cleared the forest and they generated this grazing landscape. And not all of those species would have arrived on day one. As time goes on, more and more species arrived until now it's the most floristically rich part of Britain. Well, that's now happening in urban and suburban areas here. More and more species are establishing. I sometimes muse from the delightful idea that in a few hundred years' time, our descendants are going to be conserving uh, today's suburban gardens because they have mm -hmm. such unusual biological diversity mm -hmm. that established during the current period. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so a lot of the things we cherish... Yep. are only here because of human activity. Yep. Now some of them are declining and new things are arriving and colonizing new ho human habitats that are being but created. But now we have a problem. Because the landscape you are describing, exactly the landscape where, for example, calcareous grasslands were developed. That's the landscape as you are describing in your book, giving the biggest you know, landscape diversity, diversity in habitats and landscape elements. We are exactly in that landscape develops the greatest biodiversity. You're absolutely yeah. right. But it's exactly that landscape that we're currently destroying. But the processes of gain of species that happened thousands of years ago on the chalk it's grassland our is today happening in our sure. other habitats. And, sure. and the very fact that we now have more species sure. per country than we used to tells sure. us Absolutely evidently, the data says if that more species are arriving than disappearing. Yes, if it is stable. Uh, um, but here we have the second problem that I uh, would like to address. I think uh, the cattle egret in the Atlantic forest as it is disappearing, um, uh, and, and this kind of species coming in, is what I would call the Ikeafication of the world. And what is it that I mean? Um, we have the cattle egret in uh, South America, we have it in Africa, we have it in Southern Europe. We have it in many different uh, places. Um, and uh, perhaps your evolutionary process is a reality. Uh, we'll have uh, cattle egret species in South America and a cattle egret species in Africa. And they all look like cattle egrets, but if you put them together, they have changed enough to call them different species. But you know, we have a very much, um, let's say, uh, 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 a, a landscape which is uniformized, which is very uniform at different places in the world with the same kinds of species. Um, it's like an IKEA. It's like an IKEA. I mean, it's IKEA here and in America and in China is very much the same. It differs a little bit, you know, according to the local habits. Uh, but it's a very big loss in, if not species diversity, it's going to be a very big loss in biodiversity in general. So that's a key thing, this so-called homogenization. Yes. It's clear that the number of species in common between the Netherlands now and New Zealand is greater than it was in the past. That is clearly self-evident. 
but it's not completely clear that homogenization is, is taking place at all scales, and it then becomes a human consideration as to what we care about the most. So, for example, we know for a fact that introduced plants, on average, have s that are established in both the Iberian Peninsula and Britain, we know this for at least, have smaller geographic range sizes on average, so they occur in less mm -hmm. of the country on average than the native species. The result of having lots of species that are quite localized mm. that are established mm. means from that mm. perspective, there is a greater diversity as you move around within one of these countries from one place mm. to another. Another thing that's talked about this homogenization, well, they're all the same things, they're all sparrows, they're all rats, they're all whatever it might be, is this idea that we're having a sort of a sort of more fundamental sort of degradation of the diversity of nature, which isn't just a count of the species. And so I rudely got my phone out here just to remind myself of the photograph, which none of you can see. Except but me. Except it's me. <laughs> it's a, but it's got crows here, which yeah. are European. Yeah. It's got a, an Egyptian goose from Africa and it's got a parakeet from India. These are three species. I took this photo out, it's terrible, um, in a park in Amsterdam today. So these are three, three bird families in one tree in the middle of an urban area. And, and this is a sort of rich diversity. These are each of these are in different families. And so we're seeing this, not just a count of extra species are all the same. We're seeing a greater diversity of things in one place. But that's great, but so the thing is we'll see them in all major cities all around the well world. Well, that's, yes, but that's mainly because you mainly live in major cities. It's complete, but that's the a huge difference but that's between the what's in the urban environment and what's outside. That's true, People but that's say, the homogenization oh, we're talking about. it's all the same about. things everywhere, but then what they're doing is they're thinking, because I'm seeing the same thing in London as in Amsterdam, as in Auckland in New Zealand, and, and actually, the moment you go into the bush in Auckland in New Zealand, the set of species is completely different. You go into the farmland here, it's different again. So Somewhat. I think okay. it's just a matter of the scale of the diversity, where you're looking. Mm -hmm. There's homogenization at some spatial scales, but there's diversification between human mo more and less human modified mm. and different types of human modified environment. And that diversification is actually what most people see most of the time mm -hmm. in their lives. But then I want to charge you a little, because I really like sparrows, but I also really like polar bears. Yeah. And does the does the the gain of the sparrow and the different species of sparrows sparrow make that does it make up for the loss of polar bears, for example? Oh no, these well, they well first of all the polar bear hasn't been lost no, no, yet. No, so not yet. Um, <laughs> not so, yet so so everything which has got a threat level talks people talk as though they're already extinct. And the huge <laughs> achievement of conservation has been to reduce the rate of extinction to a relatively slow trickle when it comes to the vertebrates. We have no estimate of when it comes to invertebrates that stands up. So are these species equivalent? Well, of course not. And it's a matter of uh, preference. And clearly, as humans, we tend to register um, vegetation and what the landscape looks like. We tend to look, think about the large vertebrates, the large mammals and birds. So we should try and save the polar bear. We may be able to do it. I know how to save it, but it would be an, in, uh, an ecological disaster that even I wouldn't recommend, which would be to, hand to, uh, to fly a few to Antarctica, and they'd spend a very happy um, few centuries guzzling up all the penguins. Um, that so this would be a really <laughs> stupid thing to do, and this is a sort of illustration, act in a way, of why we should be very careful. Yes. Um, and but, but why then there's, another, there's another thing that has to do with that, because because the, the, the extinction of some species is due to human activity, and that is also something that, yeah. when we had this conversation before, is that, is that a problem? Well, yes, if you think it's important to keep, as I do, to keep as many species alive as possible. That mm. it is a... Um, but it's not because they're being exterminated by humans in the sense, we are a key 
perturbing factor on the planet at the moment. So many of the things that are becoming endangered, most of them probably, are it ultimately it comes back to us for the cause of that endangerment. And what we have to look at, is there a realistic way that we could prevent these species becoming rarer and rarer and going extinct? But I think we need to have to do it by working with nature, as in working with the dynamics of nature's saving species where they can be saved, like the uh, yellow-crested cockatoos that, for example, are now established in Hong Kong and Singapore um, as escaped cage birds whilst they remain endangered in Indonesia. And so where species survive may no longer be where we traditionally thought them as coming from. Mm -hmm. so, the, so, yeah. so let's talk about stewardship. I read the Dutch translation of your book, so I'm not sure the word stewardship is in your book. Um, I suspect it's not. Um, and stewardship is, I think, an important issue. I mean, it's a driving force for many people um, uh, working on the conservation of nature. And there's reason for it. I mean, we are... Um, stewardship is rentmeester. Rentmeesterschap, sorry, in Dutch. Um, and it's interesting because whether it's a sixth ex extinction uh, uh, wave or not, there is serious extinction, and it's no doubt that we're responsible for that. What that that responsibility um, um, should that responsibility bring us? Um, it could mean that we have to protect some species. Uh, this is an open question although it may be hard to do. Um, rather than sort of put our hands in the air saying, well, you know, this is an inevitable process that our species are, bringing in, are breaking in. So there's nothing we can do about it, so just let it go. So how do you feel about stewardship? <coughs> so what I am against is throwing good money after bad. There's a limited purse for environmental measures in general, and what I don't want us to do is to keep fighting a fight that is to keep something as it was for a few decades mm. when inevitably you're going to fail to achieve that in mm -hmm. the long run. So what I, my sort of attitude is that we can be, could be as accepting that we are now part of the planet and everywhere is human altered and that we are part of the natural biological system of this planet, that we can intervene in any way that we choose. And so when I see what appear to be losing battles, I'm thinking, well, what technologies or approaches could we use that we currently tend to rule out in the conservation world because we somehow get nervous? One is potentially protecting species outside their historical geographic range particularly in the context of climate change, when they may need moving. In other cases, particularly on the um, oceanic islands, we see a lot of species um, that are not capable of dealing, for example, with Hawaiian birds with introduced diseases, which uh, the bird malaria is wiping out and, and other avian diseases, wiping out the native birds. Well, for me, this is somewhere where we can both think about the genetic modification of the mosquitoes and we can also think about most of the 10,000 species of bird on the planet actually have resistance of some kind or another to bird malaria. There's a lot of genes to choose from for resistance to bird malaria. Let's get some, mm -hmm. let's um, implant them into Hawa the remaining Hawaiian honey creepers and release disease resistant birds. So then over, it's, it's complicated, but over a period of time, then we end up with a situation where we've no longer got effectively a basket case that we're e forever treating the symptoms. We have to treat the source of the problem or convert losing cases into winning cases. And that, that is my feeling is that we're very often in the environmental movement holding back because we think, oh, this isn't quite natural, this isn't how nature works, but, but the whole world's being changed by us. So either you fight as hard as you can using whatever technologies and approaches you can to keep this stuff going, or you're going to accept that there's going to be a higher rate of loss than might otherwise be possible. 
but we should also take into account that the threat is not only, let's say, new diseases breaking in, new species coming in, um, but it's really a very complicated multiple, uh, um, uh, there are multiple causes um, for biodiversity decline. The report that, we, that I've just shown is, the, is, is clearly an example of things like invasive species, climate change, pollution, and a bunch of other things. Yes. Some things so we there's cannot. There's no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet at all. Um, uh, so there's some things we can fight, and there's some things that are very hard to fight. Mm. The polar bear is a nice example. There are many other examples which are so unique in the world because of their, for example, their unique habitat, that we might actually take out and leave out and eradicate invasive species because of the protections of very much that inheritance, that biological inheritance that we have. And although this may be very difficult to do, and we may have to continuously um, do that, and we'll be living sort of in an outside zoo in that way, so that's just, yeah, that, yes, that, so that, that might be inevitable. Yeah, and we can't, we, do that, we can't do that on a global scale. We have, we have to. Have. That is the key point, to think of long term and globally, because yes. that's the planet we live in. Fiddling in a little place, trying to keep things going, is not the way. It's big scale, long term. How do we keep the biological system of the planet going for multiple generations into the future? Absolutely, but also to take, let's say, the evolutionary history very seriously as uh, stewards, stewards of this world, and also place some really protection efforts for example, for the polar bear, for example, for a few other things, because we simply but want them to be with us. And I agree with you us. completely. For the, I wouldn't perhaps phrase it so strongly in a, a stewardship perspective uh, or some kind of moral thing, but say from the equity of generations, let's say, exactly. keeping as many of the entities exactly. alive as the building those species we've got and their descendants are the building blocks of every future ecosystem that is going to exist on this exactly. planet until we've invented artificial life and it's all gone horribly wrong. Exactly. Um, and so maintaining those building blocks is the key thing. The systems that they currently belong to are going to change. But the building blocks are still going to be the building blocks of whatever our future system is. So in that sense, I'm a very traditional conservationist because I think that we should be maintaining our species for future generations, exactly. which you can think of as this long-term stewardship, exactly. because that's going to be the bits of the puzzle that future human generations, as well as the total Earth biological system, have got to play with. But it may require that we do things that, in your context, are stupid, counterintuitive, and very expensive. In some cases, we may have to do that. I am, I am very happy that humans continue to do all sorts of stupid <laughs> things and completely confident that we will. So we're almost running out of time. I want to ask you one um, thing before we, we go to the audience. Um, Talking policies, what we were already doing, um, I was wondering what should we as, as a, a thing called the Arctic thing, either do ourselves or pressure uh, uh, the political parties we're linked to do? What are the biggest steps policy-wise that you would like to see happening? I guess now I can start, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think... Um, uh, there's increasing awareness that there's really something happening um, uh, with with nature, with biodiversity that, in the end, will harm us very much. I um, uh, think we have to do something. We, we have momentum for that in, the, in our country uh, and, and as well as in other countries. Um, but we should what we should do is is things that are really manageable. Things that and there I, I really agree with Chris is to really look ahead of what we can realize, given um, uh, certain constraints that we have. We we're not gonna going to eradicate all the invasive species that are uh, a big pest at the moment, and there are, there are quite a few. Um, so we have to take that into account. The world is definitely changing, but some things 
could definitely be a canary in the, in the coal mine. Some things could point us to changes that are really going to be very de detrimental for nature and for ourselves. We'll have to find them. Otherwise, we're moving in not into Chris's Arcadia, if I can call it that way, but we're moving into something very different. So that is the big task for us as scientists, to, to figure out exactly what those causes are and convince all the people who are involved um, in this, farmers, uh, industry, banks, politicians, to join us in that effort um, to take the right course for the future. Are you positive? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What I've been saying all the time when our study came into publicity is I don't want to stuck into sort of an Armageddon kind of story. I mean, if anything, insects are, are can definitely bounce back. I mean, they have a lot of reproductive potential. There's a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of potential for restoration if that is what we want to do and if we can really make use of the processes as described so eloquently in Chris's book, you know, that, that dynamics, that evolutionary potential, but then for that community, you know, if we can really utilize that in a good way and if, 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 if Chris's book can contribute to that, that would be a major thing. So my book, I kind of feel is about trying to bring what I feel, and not everyone agrees with all such points, <laughs> that, that what I would feel to a realism of the biological system that we are operating w within here, so that we don't attempt to do things that are so much against the grain of nature that in the long run they're going to work. So if I'm talking to a politician, what's the single most important thing you can do is to put your resources into in farming intensification, crop productivity, etc., to minimize the extra amount of land that has to be farmed across the planet to feed us. Um, and there's a bit of a, this is in, to some extent in conflict with the preferences of Northern Europeans who would like to see a de-intensification of their landscapes. But what the intensification is fine if we can get some more wildlife, be that abundances of species, greater variety of species, I'm all for that, within the landscapes that we are farming. But we shouldn't reduce the production of that land as a consequence, because the consequence of us reducing the production is that we're going to import more food from other parts of the world. That food is going to be produced somewhere, and we will effectively be exporting our biodiversity impacts as a result of that. And so I would like to see us, so a politician, I suppose I would say, think about where our food is coming from, and think about the food system and the impacts on nature as a global system and as a dynamic system. So you do conservation where it's most effective and food production where it is most efficient so that there is at least some space available for um, both us and the rest of nature. Thank you. I saw you didn't completely agree, but uh, that might be a topic for at the bar <laughs> later on. <laughs> um, is there a question? Um, I haven't heard neither of you talk about our oceans because I see that being a very problematic area. Um, we see an acceleration of warmth in the water. Uh, we're depending on food webs that simply depend on each other and they are very disturbed. They're out of whack, they're out of balance at the moment. And if we're gonna see more jellyfish, which is one of the results because of warming water, we can't eat jellyfish. So we, we have a direct crisis at hand here with our oceans. Can you please comment on either one of you, how you, what your take on that is? So um, thank you very much for that question. You're right, and I didn't concentrate on the oceans, partly because it's not my area of expertise, and I um, realized that it would cause double the length of book, and so, um, so, the, that's the other thing I would say to politicians is 
that in long-term development is, well, first of all, greenhouse gases kill this CO2 production right now as fast as possible because that's generating the acidification of, as well as the temperature change. So that's key thing. And the second thing, though, and the sort of what I feel more fundamentally is that we've got to stop acting like hunter-gatherers in the oceans. The, we, the, if we stopped farming livestock and went over to being hunter-gatherers again on the planet's surface and hunting all the large animals, the large mammals and birds would all, there wouldn't be of any of those herons and storks in the park I saw today, they'd all be in our stomachs. In fact, we run out of the entire lot of large animals in about a month. And so um, this is completely unsustainable on land not to have a food meat production system. And we're by and large not doing this in the oceans. We're just going in with a big net and saying, oh, look what I found and consuming it. And so we need to work out how we have a equivalent of productive farming system in parts of the oceans so that we can more strictly leave other parts to be uh, unperturbed. I couldn't agree more, and also you see that there are multiple causes um, coming together, and uh, they are multiplicative. They really add to the big problems that we see in our oceans. I have another question over here. Uh, yes, so we were talking about uh, the, um, the, that the richest, the biodiverse richest places now were the places which uh, in the past used to be agricultural areas or stuff like that. And you were talk also talking about our agricultural areas now becoming maybe later those rich places, but we're, we have become much better at killing stuff off actually with pesticides and stuff like that. Um, so how do you see the diversification rate in the future changing, or, or now already even? So we're going to meet lots of new challenges, and whether it's near nicotinoids or whatever it is, stuff's going to come along that presents new challenges. So it's not all rosy. We've got to be on the alert the whole time. So how do I see that? Well, of course, the, um, the genetic modification of crops was was sort of sold to us as to how it was going to be the solution of everything, and then they came up with sort of roundup ready whatever it was. Um, and but but I think we need farming systems where the killing. And this was the idea of neonicotinoids, but unfortunately, it didn't doesn't seem that it quite worked out the way that was intended. Um, the the idea w though is that we try to find ways, uh, and there's no single answer, in which the pesticides, etc., are delivered directly and maybe genetically targeted at the specific problem, insects, diseases, etc., that they are intended to kill and minimize by kill, if you like. Another question? Oh, I have two over here. I'm sorry, I'm going to bring two. Not much knowledge on uh, bio, bio, biology or ecology. Uh, um, my question is, um, is a polar bear um, as important as, say, an ant uh, species? Because um, I would say it depends on the function that um, um, uh, an animal has in, in, the, in the pyramid, in the food pyramid or in the, in the food chain. So predators has given, say, more importance uh, than, um, uh, I, well, a, 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 a plant uh, a f um, variety or maybe, I don't know. <laughs> well, we know that, so some of you may have heard the term so-called keystone species, which I'm not very fond of as a term myself, but it's effectively acknowledging that some species in the eco ecosystems have much bigger effects on other species. So, so there's lots of species that you can add to a habitat or remove, and not much happens to the rest of the species there. There's a sort of, sort of minor adjustment. And then there's a few species you add that it completely transforms the world. So for example, when the open grasslands of um, Europe met the trees that had previously been rare in the Balkans during the Ice Ages, um, suddenly a few species of tree completely transformed an entire continent. So occasionally this happened. And most of the species that are defined as invasive 
are species that have these disproportionate effects on the biological communities. However, so this is an important realization, but I would uh, say that you may disagree, but my, my perception is that biologists have not been very good at spotting which of these species are going to have disproportionate effects until an awful lot of study has been done. And so there's no quick and easy way, just because something's big or has, is at a certain point in the food chain, isn't, doesn't seem to be a brilliant predictor of whether it, when you remove it or you change its abundance, everything else is going to change as a consequence. So it's an important issue, but I don't think it's one that we understand enough about, at least yet. Mm -hmm. I guess that's true uh, in, in, for example, grasslands, flower-rich, species-rich grasslands. There have been studies done, a uh, whole bunch of experimental studies. And the end of it shows that nearly all species do make some contributions for some functions, which is interesting because you could have you know, 80 different species. Um, so there's some redundancy, there's some overlapping functions, but they all contribute. A very different issue is, of course, a more ethical one, is you know, an ant species worth anything more or less than... Uh, As an insect th th ecologist, the obviously. Obviously, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> oh, he says obviously. <laughs> We have one more question over here. Uh, well, if you if you want the intensification of agriculture to to rise, then you and neonicotines, for for example, are very good for intensification and they're mm. successful yep. in that way. So we need more yep. of these kind of but neonicotines. But in a way that doesn't then deliver the poison, the whatever mm. it is, to the things that weren't the target. That's that's the trick. So it's, it's intensification, but in a smarter way as we can possibly achieve. There's a, there are essential trade-offs that cannot be bound. Yeah, that's that, right. They cannot be overcome. Yeah, so I that's I'm, right. not, I'm not sure that's the way to go. So if you don't want intensification, what's your proposal for the world's food production? Oh, that's very simple. Um, I think it's well known that there is essentially uh, enough food being produced, but it's produced at the wrong place, um, at the wrong time, and there's a lot of food lost. So is uh, the Netherlands a net exporter of food then? Uh, it's the second largest export uh, country in the world, which is ridiculous. Food. Yeah, it's completely ridiculous. Uh, and the price that we uh, that we pay is is completely clear. It's the neonic neo uh, neonics and, and 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 the pollution of our uh, groundwater. And what you can do is you can say, well, compared to the current production levels, let's get that production down to say about seventy percent, but do it in a nature inclusive way. Use the biodiversity in the landscape. If we're moving to further intensification, we can forget about nature. I mean, in that area. Yes. But to double the food production... There's no need to. There's absolutely no need to. I'm very pleased that you're going to go into politics and you're going to sort out food distribution. Yeah. I mean, I that's a difficult I issue. I have complete I confidence I that no, you're no, going no, to No, that's a difficult it. issue. I agree. But that's the main problem, really. I think this is an issue that my colleague Tim Bagemakers probably will make a program about uh, <laughs> uh, in the future, <laughs> about food production and agriculture. Um, but it's time for us to round up. So, uh, Professor De Kroon, Professor Thomas, thank you very, very much for being here tonight. Um, your book is for sale, and I heard you were willing to sign a few copies. I'm willing to sell my soul, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's lovely. Um, uh, thank you again, and thank you all also for being here uh, tonight. And uh, uh, um, they'll be around for a bit if you have no. another question or yeah. something else. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. And Right, <laughs> great. I